to come to a day that I met the Savior, Jesus, by way of a prayer. An amazing, amazing transformation. But to understand what it is to have a conversion of a human heart from lost to found. Amen? You have to be there. You have to experience it. Otherwise, the only thing that you're experiencing is a religious experience. And I'm going to be straight with you. That makes me want to throw up in my own mouth. It's dry. It's powerless. And it doesn't change you. Amen? Christ changes you. Amen? And so, to know who he is, you have to have had an encounter to meet him. Amen? At some point in time, you had to have a collision course with the Savior. And he, he does that by way of circumstances, usually the folly of our own stupidity, that leads us down roads that we cannot get out of on our own, only to provide a way out. Almost to, if you can have the image of quicksand and having a hand at the last minute pull you out of there standing you on solid ground. And then through our folly, we fumble around and we struggle with stepping back into that quicksand or maybe substandard ground thinking that it'll be all right, right? Only to find out the further you go down the road with this journey with Christ, the further you travel it, you really get to know who he is. Amen? Because you you find yourself through these different parts of your journey where you veer off course and do stupid things only to get brought back because he that began that good work in you, he's faithful to bring it to completion. Amen. Praise God for that truth. But he does this thing. So we're moving along and we're kind of like doing this S thing and he's the perfect plumb line. And every time we wander off a little bit, he pulls us back and we kind of got one of these things going. That was a, an, a, an image that Pastor Clark used to draw on the board. And he used to tell us, you know, there's Christ, here's us. But he's faithful. Praise God for that. Amen? So he would draw us back. And through every one of those curves that we find ourselves getting pulled back and forth, back to the symmetrical, you know, journey that he's called us to, we learn things on those curves, don't we? Some of them curves you learn, you never want to go on one of them again. Until the next time you go on one of them. But the truth of it is, you do learn things. And as you get older, as you mature in Christ, you change. You know who He is. You know without a shadow of a doubt that He is the Son of the Almighty, that He died on a cross and He rose on the third day. There is nothing in all creation that can take that reality away from this lost one who got saved. Amen? Because I know it because I know what it was to be lost and hopeless. And I know what it is to be found and then continually brought back to a right relationship with the one who started it in the first place. Amen? So that's great stuff. Just as an intro coming in, I was just like, you know what, just to get your mind wrapped around what captivated my mind this week, there's usually something in a devotion that I'm doing that gets a hold of my thinking, and I can't let it go. I mean, it gets a hold of my thinking. Sometimes I share it in our, our morning devotions, and sometimes I don't. This one is a direct result of, you know, where we are on the calendar in relation to Easter. You know, as we, as we approach, you know, Good Friday, and we understand what that looks like before you get to Easter Sunday, the, the enormity of the cross, as you approach that, the reality that, that cross was endured for us, amen? He endured the cross for us, but any time you really direct your thinking back, to the cross, we can see ourselves sometimes in the pages of Scripture, in the lives that went before us, the folly of their thinking, and we can see ourselves in the circumstances that affect our lives. 
And if we're smart, we'll make application at someone else's expense. Are, are you with You ever try to teach a teenage or something? You can't do it. You hear what I'm saying? You want to save them some pain? You can't do it. You can tell them. You can be as creative. Man, you could be the most creative communicator on the planet. And they're going to do it their way. They're going to look back and go, I wish I would have listened to that. But the truth is very unlikely that they're going to grasp it, right? And, and, and learn from your mistake and say, I'm going to be spared the pain. That's what preachers do. Preachers come in and say, for everything I'm worth, I'm going to plead with you not to go down the roads I was on. And I think sometimes people hear me like this. Right? They hear something like that. But this right here, I think, is significant. Because I know something. You know, I know how rebellious I was as a lost man. I know that my little sister, again and again and again, so did my other siblings, but my littlest sister told me how I needed Jesus on a regular basis. She never let up. Man, and I used to tell her, you are, get away from me. You freak. I thought she was the craziest person on the planet. She never stopped. You know, that's the one who led me to Christ, amen? Because when God brought me to the end of myself, that's the one I called because I wanted what she had. But the truth of it is, she knew what she had. She knew what she had. And when I came to the end of myself and God brought me to the, you know, the place to just be on my knees wanting death, and then I remember that little sister that had something I didn't have. Amen? And she knew who Jesus was. So I've got a scripture here I want to look at. It's Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and gave to, and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the, to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, the Lord needs them. Tell them that the Lord needs them. And he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what, the, what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, a fall of a donkey, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt at the place and they placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road and the crowds that went ahead of them, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Interestingly, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up and they asked, Who is this? Who is this? That's the first Palm Sunday, if you will. They're cutting tree, limbs off the trees and they're waving them at them. Amen. And they're laying their coats on the ground one after another and just picking it up and rolling and he's going through. And, and these people, they knew that this Jesus was special. There was a crowd, and they had these uh, this pretty consistent theme going there with a coat being laid out on the ground after another after another, and they're shouting, and, and they're excited, right? They had some things going on. Some believe, you know, they had seen Jesus, and they had heard him in action. They heard him teach and preach, and he preached, and he taught with bold authority. And he performed many miracles that they saw. They've seen it with their own eyes. 
as a result, they wanted some of that. There's all this excitement going on. You ever know how people get excited about stuff like that, right? They get excited about, well, we know he spoke with such great authority. You get excited. You get excited about new things that are going on, but you really get excited when you see people with leprosy healed. You really get excited when you see things happen like someone like says something like this, Lazarus come forth and a dead man comes out of a tomb. You get excited. So there was those who saw that directly. There was ones that heard of that indirectly. And there was massive crowds. All of them, this is going on at the same time. And so Jesus is getting ready to face this hour. He's fulfilling the prophecy, the prophecies that were foretold of him, Zechariah. 9.9 9, 9 is exactly the quote that was there. Rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, in the foal of a donkey. They did just as Zechariah 9.9 9 said. Amen? The crowds were exactly doing those things. I don't know how people get lost and they lose sight of what's really going on there. I wonder if somebody was thinking, is this the fulfillment of the prophecies we've heard that we're watching right in front of us? Never consider what the words were even spoken. And then there's the other ones that wanted to know what this big excitement was. Same crowd. They want to know what the people were singing about, shouting about. They wanted to know, who is this? Who is this? How do these people coexist? How do they coexist? Some know who he is. They've heard of the miracles, they, or they saw the miracles directly. Some of them may even have put some of the prophecies of old and put them in together and thought this is probably the fulfillment, maybe perhaps. But other ones, they're in the same crowd and they're like, who is this? Who is this? I I would think maybe that's a question that I would ask here tonight. Is that, who is Jesus to you? I mean, when you consider the crowd, the people that surround us, Would the people that frequent with you be one of the crew that was saying, who is this? Or would they know by your testimony? Because this is just real life stuff here, right in the pages of Scripture. This is unfolding. It came up. Jesus was talking about it. You know, I was thinking about the pantry closing down, you know, having our final day. And people heard that. Right? I promise you, on Tuesday and on next Saturday, there's going to be people parked out in front of that building. Now, we told them, we gave printed material, but they didn't hear. I would be absolutely amazed if there at least wasn't five or ten cars that show up out of that crew that just somehow didn't hear. And so when I consider what it is, this who is this thing is huge. Can you imagine being on planet Earth walking the ground with the disciples, with Jesus on the scene? Man, there was things going on. You imagine at, they were asking, who is this? Who is this that? I'm going to give you some of the miracles. Who turned dirty water into the best wine of the evening? Who is this that drives out evil spirits? Who is this that heals the sick and the oppressed? Who is this that cleanses a man with leprosy? Who is this that heals a centurion's paralyzed servant? Or who is this that heals a a uh, paraplegic uh, person? Who is this that heals a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath? Who is this that raised all the commotion with the Pharisees? Who is this that raised the widow's son from the dead? And who is it 
who calmed the storm at sea? Who is it that cast demons into a herd of pigs? Or who is it that healed a woman in a crowd that had issues of bleeding? Who is it who raised Jar's daughter back to life? And who is it that heals two blind men? Who is it that heals a man who was unable to speak? And who is it that fed the 5,000 in the women and children? Who is it that walked on water and scared the disciples? Who is it that heals a Gentile woman's demon-possessed daughter because she was persistent and said that even dogs get the crumbs? Who is it that heals a a deaf and dumb man? Who is it that feeds the 4,000 plus women and children? Or who, who is it that heals a blind man? Who is it that heals a man born blind by spitting in some mud and making a paste and putting it on his eyes? Who is it that heals a boy with an unclean spirit? And who is it that pulls a coin out of a fish's mouth to pay the tax? Who is it that cleansed ten lepers on the way to Jerusalem? And who is it that raised Lazarus from the dead? And who is it that heals a soldier's ear that was cut off at the time of his arrest? I'll tell you who it was. It was Jesus. Amen? It was Jesus. And when I think about Jesus' perspective was always focused on the mission. That's some of Jesus' miracles. That's not all of them. That's one that this dumb guy could think of. Jesus heals the soldier's ear and prevents serious problems happening to Peter when he's going through the most dramatic experience that any of us would ever encounter. He's on target to accomplish the purpose. But I think about it in our lives. You know, the disciples, Jesus talked to them and he tried to prepare them on their journey. They saw these miracles with their own eyes. The people that were in this crowd heard of these miracles, many of them. Some of them may have saw. Some of them believed and others said, who is this man? Some of them heard the naysayers in the crowd that had things to say. Some of them got hung up on what they heard, I'm sure. Some of them were influenced by what they heard. You should listen to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and following says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what do you... What do you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. So let me ask, you got these guys that are really tight and they're hanging out with Jesus and they're, he's on the scene and he is building The church, they don't know it. They don't have a clue. But that's the church that's going to raise up from these guys. And so as this is unfolding, they're walking with him. And and he asked this question because now we're getting down to, you know, it's getting time to, to get this crew in gear because he's going to be going back to heaven after the crucifixion. And they're the church. Who do you say I am? And Peter comes out with these words that are profound. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But God revealed it to him, right? And so he knew that. He knew that. But you know the things that happened in poor Peter's life? You know, (laughs) I'll die for you, right? You remember that? I'll die for you. There's no nothing that's going to separate us, right? Until that moment when he drew his sword out and cut the ear off that soldier and it fell to the ground. And Jesus picked it up and put it back on him and healed it. And he realized there's not going to be a fight here. He's going with them soldiers. 
and then the words, maybe, you know, it's like when you speak to somebody, they don't listen to you. You tell them ten times the same thing, they don't hear it. And then just maybe, maybe as he's standing there and there's this, this army, of, they're all armed, he's standing there, and Jesus puts the ear on and he hears him saying, the Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men. He's thinking, oh my word. I don't know how to act with this. I know how to act with Jesus when I'm walking in a crowd and He's healing people. I know how to handle walking with Jesus when He is the man. I know how to even ha- walk with Him when He's making the Pharisees look like monkeys. I'm cool with that. But I ain't cool with this. I'm not cool with this at all. Because they aggressively grab a hold of Him in the beginning of this cycle, is right before his eyes. And we have a guy that understood, yeah, who is this Jesus? A, a, an anointing from the Almighty that spoke right out of his mouth. This, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Speaks it out of his mouth. Jesus himself says, that didn't come from you, pal. That came my, from my Father who gave you that information. He knew who he was. But when the game changed, are you guys with me? When the game changed, in other words, the circumstances of life didn't go down the road that he thought they should go down. You know how I know that? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this one out. He pulled the sword out. But Jesus never had any defense for himself at all. At all. The only thing that he said remotely that would appear to be a defense is he said, you have no power other than what my Father has given you. That's it, folks. That's it. Jesus knew who he was, didn't he? He knew that cross was his. Nobody else's. Peter didn't get it. And our lives look like that when we... We try to live a Christian life. We're trying to be a light, right? We want to show this world Jesus. We, we want to live in a way that they get it. So we do things. We try to put ourselves in alignment with what we think about God. But remember that, that curve that I was talking about like this? You're all over the place. We get in these pursuits. We're doing the wrong thing. And we don't get ourselves aligned with the Holy Spirit that will keep us on the plumb line. Which means we've got to die to self. And that puts us dead center. But I still have my own desires and I'm going like this. And Peter, he thought, you know, these guys are arguing who's going to sit beside you in heaven, right next to you. That's your conversation, guys? But what about us? I mean, the reality of our lives, when you consider what does it look like for us to process what it is to be a disciple of Jesus with this reality, That the work that he has put before you to accomplish isn't, is not for you to prosper according to your own plan. It's not. It's the work he's put before us is to put an arrow right to the Messiah. You know, I, I thank the Lord for my little sister. And I talk about her a lot, I have over the years. You know why? You know, is she a super Christian? No. She was a super Christian when it counted, though, I'm going to tell you that. Because I picked the phone up and that's who I called. Because I, without a shadow of a doubt, seen Jesus in her. And so through the ridicule of my... If you could imagine who I was before I met Christ as a criminal... Not just a guy that was working some secular job somewhere doing this. No, no, I'm talking about a criminal. A selfish, inconsiderate, you know, villain who deserved incarceration. And by the grace of God, instead of giving me that, he brought me to my knees and my little sister introduced me to the one who saved her. And that's who I am today. 
But the truth of it is when I, when I look back at that, my, the persuasion that I come with is to tell you this journey is real and we keep getting sidetracked. We keep on this winding roads. We keep doing this nonsense. And he says, no, there's somebody watching you and this journey's real and they need to see me in you. Consistently. Consistently. Because when the battle rages, here's the problem. When the battle rages and we start doing this wiggling nonsense, that's when it counts. That's when it counts. So when I get my mind wrapped around this Jesus and who I am and how hopeless I am without Him, and then how enlightened I am when I just quit messing around with trying to figure things out, I quit trying to mess around, calculate my course, and I just get back to the foot of the cross. Plead with him. I, I, I can't even walk without you, without holding your hand. I like that old song says, can't even walk without even hold, without holding your hand. I'm helpless without you. And the reality is now I, now I can do that. Listen, as a carnal Christian, there's a word you don't hear much in the church anymore. Carnal Christian. You know, I'm Christian by name. I live whatever way I want. It's a cardinal Christian. Hey, listen, I live my life any way I want. Nothing to see here. I'll go and do anything I want to do. Devil's going to leave you alone. No problem. You're not going to have any opposition. You know why? Because you ain't doing nothing. Nobody's eternity is being invaded because of you. In other words, as soon as you get serious about... You know, the journey that the cross paid for, you can count on you're going to have opposition. All of hell's fury is coming after you. And, and, he, and, and here's how it is. It's, he's going to come against our flesh. He's going to come against the things that are your dreams. He's going to try to shatter them. But yet, you know, whatever the devil tries to shatter, you know what God's got? You know what? He'll give you the desires of your heart when your heart turns to him. But God will let you get the tar whooped out of you and lose things because he wants you to let go and then he'll give you what your heart turns to him. It's a vicious cycle, folks. Listen, I go home sometimes after I preach. In my voice, I've strained my vocal cords a few weeks ago. They were so bad that I, I, you know, I, we went to the ER over the deal. Because I'm screaming. I'm just trying to say, listen to what I'm telling you. Because one day this is all over. And I'm telling you, as the seasons of life change, as I watch the years pass, we were just talking, we're 17 years we were in a food pantry. Dave goes, I was there 12 years since he got here. The time has passed like you snapped your fingers and it's gone. That's in the rearview mirror, folks. Now we move forward to the next journey. But how long is it until Jesus returns? Because listen, right now, who is this Jesus? You know, if you're in a company of people, and then who is this Jesus? You want, want to consider you ought to be able to show them who Jesus is with your life. Right? The most haunting words you could ever hear is, depart from me, you do of iniquity. I never knew you. And so... To hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the goal for all of us, amen? But more than just to hear those words, to have earned those words because we got our mind on what our mission is here. We got our mind wrapped around who is this Jesus that we speak of? So, you know, when I consider, we got Peter, you know, he was having issues and he denied Jesus because he got the snot shook out of him, right? He's in the garden. The soldiers come. He draws the sword, whacks an ear, and he thinks Jesus is going to call down legions of angels, and this thing's over right now. And instead he puts the ear back on, and Peter's like, I don't know how to respond to this. This is sacrifice like I've never seen. And then the beating occurs, starts to begin, all this. Now it's getting real. And in our life, you know, we're followers of Jesus. And man, when I was a brand new believer, I always thought, you know, I need to, you know, 
move along and God's going to just bless me, bless me, bless me because I'm just Jesus everything. I'm just like a flower, right? And all the hell comes unleashed on me. And I'm like, what? Man, this Heavenly Father thing, man, what's the deal? You know, I'm reading scriptures, you know, who, who has a son that would want bread and I give him a rock. Man, you gave me a boulder. So that's the road I gave for you. To whom much is given, much is required. You have redemption. Now go rescue your friends. Well, I'm not the only one that struggled through this, and nor are you. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2 and following. Remember John? When John, who was in prison, heard about all the deeds that The Messiah, of the Messiah, he sent his disciples and he asked, Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Same boat. Jesus replied, listen to this. This is what I would say. You imagine us, right? We're struggling, having a rough day, each one of us. You know them days, right? When you're doubting your salvation and all this stuff. Malarkey! We got to turn it around. Listen, Jesus replied, go back! And report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The death hear and the dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Amen? Don't you think we got to circle ourselves with a group of folks that are going to talk like that to us when we're having a bad day? You understand, we're Americans. We live in this pansy kind of bubblegum society right now. I think you just need a powder. You, you're just, I think you could use some pampering. Eh. Huh? What? How about we get our mind wrapped around? We're redeemed. Hello? We're redeemed. The scripture says, to whom much is given, much is required. I got a buddy that died just before I got saved. Right? We were bad guys. And his destiny, I'm not saying he's in a better place. You hear what I'm telling you. But yet God chose to rescue me. To whom much is given, much is required. If you've entered into that relationship with Christ, if you've received that forgiveness, you know what he says? Use your life to persuade others who don't get it. Right? Use your life. You know, get your eyes off this nonsense because none of you, none of you would would treat somebody that way who is you know, critically injured or needed medical attention, man, you race them to the hospital, do anything. You, you miss work, you do, you know, whatever it takes, you're taking them to the hospital, you're going to stay with them to a, with a loved one, amen? But yet we walk in the counsel of the wicked, right? We sit with the mockers, the ones who mock God, as though they're brethren. And the truth of it is, We're supposed to be salt and light. And you're going to take ridicule, I'm going to tell you right now. You chart that course, hang on. You're going to take ridicule. But I'm going to tell you this. My little sister, out of all the years, now listen. I've got family members that call me for counsel. I was the black sheep of that crazy family, right? But it's not about calling counsel. It's about, it's about, God redeeming and then sanctification in the process. It's, he's, he's not prejudiced or biased. And because I've taken that serious, that I've got something to say, right? But my little sister is a giant to me. Because she took the ridicule that brought me to the point that I can act like I got some sense. She showed me the Jesus herself. You know, she kind of was like like the Jesus who was getting spat upon or battered and never let that affect her attitude. 
And you know what? It paid off. So when I look back, I just consider, you know, each one of us and how real life is. John, you know, was sitting in that prison and he's ruined because all these other ones are out there. Jesus is still on the scene doing his hocus pocus stuff, right? And I'm sitting in my jail cell. That's our lives. You know what I consider? John's in the jail and what a contrast, John and Paul, huh? Paul and Silas, midnight comes, they're sitting in a jail cell and they're singing praises in the middle of the night. And what was the outcome? The jailer and his household were saved. What mission did John have when his jail cell? We don't know that, do we? Because he lost sight of the mission. And my point is to say, you know, as we approach this week, that's it's the holiest week. Without this week that we're entering into, we're lost, folks. You hear what I'm telling you? So this is a week you want to consider. To say, God, how do I present myself in a way somebody's going to get it? Maybe they'll see the Jesus in me. Maybe it's things I involve myself in. Maybe it's things that I that I withdraw from. Maybe I'm going to have a level of integrity that's going to be seen and they'll, they'll laugh and ridicule me. Maybe it's, I'm going to tell somebody whether they want to hear it or not. Maybe I'm going to lose a friend over telling them the depth of their need for Christ. But I'm telling you this. For me, I know who Jesus is. You hear what I'm saying? So, I have no reason for somebody in the crowd with me to say, who is this? Present that question. Who is this? Because if they're saying that, I must have been having an issue with telling them what this is all about. Right? So it's not about all the things we make it about. It's not about feeling better because we helped somebody do this, that, or the other thing. It's about Somebody receiving Christ, and then when we receive Christ, that we care enough for what Jesus did on that cross to afford us to be able to say, Abba, Father, from being foreigners and aliens, exiled, deserving of God's wrath, to being able to be co-heirs with Christ. We know who we are. At least at that moment when you receive Christ, you know who you are. And then from there, we're supposed to go out in this world and help others know who he is. Amen? So I don't know where you're at tonight. I always give an invitation. I always give an opportunity for you to respond because, you know what? There's so many times we get on this journey of life as Christians, and I'm going to tell you what. I don't know if it's like we're oxygen deprived or something. We, we get into this crazy fog like doesn't look anything like I'm salt and light, primary purpose that's what it is i'm supposed to show people the love of god through my life amen and i do it with a consistent journey is amazing somebody had walked into the food pantry a while back and i was just thinking about that of how many people have come over the years and the the, the five years goes by ten years goes by and they come in and they're like you guys are still here. You know what? Here's the truth. Considering that, it's made a huge impact on people. Let me just tell you something. They're going to come the next time, and until they, the other people get that up and running, they're not. we're not going to be there. But you know who is? Jesus. And our life is supposed to be that representation. Because we've been as faithful as we can. But listen, at the end of the day, they need Christ. Not a bologna sandwich. Sorry, Johnny. Wherever you're at tonight, respond to God. You know, you can ask yourself some questions. Would those around me know who he is because of my presence? I'm not talking about the circle you run with. I'm talking about the ones outside that circle. 
talking about the crowd. Some that heard, some are the crew you run with. Some seen the miracles in your life. Yeah. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the ones in the crowd who are lost and destined to a place called hell outside of Christ. And he's called our lives to make an impact. There's going to be a collision course when that happens. There's going to be costs. I'll tell you right now, the biggest prayer you might say is, God, I want to get off this S-curve thing. I want to stay right on course with you. I'm going to tune my ear to you, and that's it. That's a good one. There's never been a time that you've come and you've asked the Lord to rescue you, to save you, to receive redemption by way of a prayer that need to happen. Let it happen tonight. Come on up. Counselors, come on up here. Consider this. This Easter could be the best Easter you've ever experienced. Amen? Because Good Friday, Good Friday was a very dark, dark day. But praise God, there was an Easter morning. Amen? But Easter morning doesn't mean anything to you if you pass on the free gift of salvation. It's offered, but you have to receive it. You have to receive it. As the music plays, will you respond? Whatever way God is talking to you, we want to pray with you. As the music plays.